Okay, here we are. It looks like this is week 13. I can't believe it. We only have two weeks left. Um, this week, there's no anomalies, but next week is uh, election day on Wednesday. And the week after that, uh, there's a holiday on the 1st of June, right? So, uh, but that doesn't matter. We do this online and you have a week to watch the video, but really, I, I t as I told you before, um, you should watch this video before Friday's class because all of these things are related to each other and I sometimes refer to things that I said in the online lecture. So if you don't watch it until after Friday's class, you might be confused about what's going on. Uh, I hope the our representatives in the sports day on Friday won. Usually the English department wins the soccer match. I don't know if you knew that, but we, um, we're very competitive and um, usually we win the, da the dance competition and we won, uh, we've won the soccer match over and over the soccer tournament since I came here. I've been here for 13 years, believe it or not. Um, and uh, usually the students brag to me when they win. So hopefully I hear some bragging on Friday. That would be good, because why would you miss class and lose the soccer game? That's that's not useful. Um, <clears throat> so, since this is week thirteen, and then next week is going to be our last week, we've we've uh, gone blown through this course. Uh, as you know, there's a lot of material, and we've gone very quickly. So there's a makeup week, but we don't need to worry about that. We're going to be done. All right, we are on week fifteen. Uh, on the makeup week. So we, this will be our, the third will be our final class. June 3rd will be our final class. And uh, the 10th is a makeup day uh, for a Wednesday class. So I think we're gonna use that to have the exam. It will be done. I, I hope all of you are happy about that. Um, the thing is, we got a lot of stuff to talk about in the next two weeks. And uh, I'm going to, after we finish the material of week 14, I'm going to do like you know, the same thing, like a, a online review so you can make some notes and uh, know what you need to study to prepare for the exam. I always do that. So that'll be online as well. So we have this is week 13. Next week will be the last new content uh, online. And then after that, I will upload um, a midterm, uh, sorry, a review for the exam for you to, to watch and that's it, okay? So there's one more class online and then there's the review, that's it. So we have two Friday classes and then we have the exam. Um, we're on chapter seven. This is gonna be very tight to get through this material because there's a lot of stuff, uh, but we'll see. Sometimes I end up just like cutting off chapter eight because chapter eight is quite short and um, it depends. It depends on how much time we have, but it might not fit in. So this is what we're going to do today. Today we have uh, several objectives. Uh, I want to talk about American identity as, as it is changing into the 20th century, uh, the last century in which I was born, and some of you were not. But I was born in 1981, so I saw the, the uh, when I was growing up, I saw the end of this era in the beginning of the 21st century. So um, I wanna talk about that. We wanna get, by the end of this class, we wanna be like up to date, pretty much. The class will end in the 21st century. And um, so I wanna talk about American character uh, as, it, as it develops over the 20th century in general. Um, I wanna talk about some presidents and I wanna talk about World War I. And that's that's it. That's it for today. Uh, so the, actually the, as I told you before, this is not going to be as chronological. It's not going to be like this happened, then this happened, then this happened, uh, the way that it was earlier in the course with the older stuff, the ancient culture. This is uh, I'm going to talk about things by theme. So today we're talking about American identity as it relates to the president of the United States and the world wars that, the wars essentially that the United States participated in. 
And next class, we're going to talk about um, sort of a breakdown uh, of, of the 20th century um, in America. And next week, we're going to talk about, you know, uh, sort of cultural features of America going into the 21st century, which is chapter eight. So what's going to happen today in terms of the book is the start of the chapter is about modernism and World War I and the end of the British Empire. And then the middle part, I'm going to skip. And then I'll pick it up with Churchill, uh, and uh, which he's kind of stuck in the middle of the chapter, and then skip again to the end of the chapter and talk about the presidents, okay? So let, let's, let's uh, get into this transformation of American character, because this is the title of today's lecture. Today's lecture is called American Transformation because the, the America that we've been talking about so far this half of the semester since the midterm is largely the America of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and as, it, as the country changes because of industrial um, development and because of commercial development and transportation and so on um, it the character its national character starts to change uh, so we talked about a lot about the expansion and the the uh, frontier idea the frontier is gone so now America has sort of reached its maximum extent so there's nowhere else to expand there's no uh, line for it to push now, if America wants to develop, uh, to expand further, um, it has to take land from other places. But that's against, sort of against the principle of America's, the belief of what America is, right? It's supposed to actually manifest destiny is for it develop, to develop land uh, that, that's not developed or occupied, even though it really is. This is an illusion, it's a myth, and that, uh, that, that uh, it, it needs to be civilized. But if you want to, now if they want to expand beyond their borders, they're either going to have to take the colonial possessions of other countries, or they're gonna have to actually compete with other empires, right? They, that's the only, otherwise, they're gonna just have to stay within their own borders. And th that's where the, the two-headed giant contradiction uh, starts to occur is that what is America's role internationally? Is it supposed to just exist as this big, you know, giant thing uh, separate from all, or is it supposed to be like a leader in, in world politics? So let me explain that way back before even Abraham, Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War, going back several lectures, I never mentioned this, but um, these are some of the early presidents. I mentioned the first five presidents were from Virginia, and uh, a, there was a lot of slaveholders and there was a lot of influence. Um, Virginia was a slave state, <clears throat> and Virginia was the most important state in, in the uh, Confederacy. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the Confederacy, uh, when the, the American Civil War happened, Virginia was the, the most powerful influential state uh, of the South. So ultimately, it, to win the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant, who I'm still imitating with my beard, they had to defeat Virginia. Um, and Virginia, but you know, now Virginia is not an important state at all, but for the first 100 years, for the, the whole colonial period, and the first 100 years of the United States, it was one of the most important states its importance is going to diminish rapidly as states like Texas and uh, California continue to, and Florida, their populations rise and their development in, in various sectors like agriculture and California. I mean, California is just a, a monster. It has the highest population. It has a gigantic diversified economy technology and everything. So as these other states become the, 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 loci the locus of American culture, Virginia is going to sort of 
fade away into the background. Um, so there's a, there's a president, <clears throat> early president named John Quincy Adams. Um, he makes a speech, very famous speech. Let me just <clears throat> quote it. Um, he does this speech about in 1821, and it's, a, it's an echo of George Washington's policy. George Washington thinks that European, Europe is basically at, always at war, constantly shifting alliances, and they're always fighting, and they're always... It's true. Uh, you can go on YouTube, and you can look at a uh, time-lapse of the map of Europe. Uh, it's it's uh, breathtaking. You can look at like a 10 minute time lapse that shows um, from the fall of the Roman Empire, so like Europe is unified, and look at all the states that appear and disappear for the last 1,600 years. And, and literally there's hundreds. They're like Poland's there and then Poland's gone. And then, you know, <clears throat> Germany's there and then Germany's on and Germany's a hundred different states and then it's one state, you know, there, there's certain periods like Charlemagne uh, and Louis the 14th and uh, Who are the other ones? I'm uh, Charles Charles the I think um, Charles in the uh, 16th century Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor, almost unified like half of Europe. Like there's periods, Napoleon obviously, where Europe like unifies and then it shatters into little pieces. So it, it's just like a constant, I mean, George Washington's a good student of history. He, he knows that Europe is a, a constantly, you know, warring, com competitive, you know, um, that, that's why we have the EU now. We have the EU now to try and stabilize the European continent. But uh, if you look at China and you look at the history of China, it's just like one big Chinese empire and then it collapses and then there's another big Chinese empire and then that collapses. And there's another, that's not what Europe looks like. It's hundreds of different small states always breaking away and fighting each other. So the, the point is, do we, does the United States want to be involved in that? Do they want to be on the French side or the German side? or the British side, or the Spanish side, or whatever, the Swedish, there's so many different sides, you can't win. So George Washington's idea was that the United States should main, remain neutral. They should not be allied with anybody. Obviously the French had a big problem with that because the French helped the United States come into existence. If the French had not helped George Washington and the Americans fight, against the British, they would never have won the war. That's something I didn't emphasize, but uh, we have one French student in the class, and to be fair, uh, there was no chance that, that if the French didn't intervene and, and distract the British at the very least, which they did more, they did more than distract. There was um, one, of the, one of the commanders in the uh, American Revolutionary War, his name was uh, Lafayette, and I won't get into his personal details and his history, but he serves under George Washington uh, and he becomes, you know, uh, a representative of the revolution. Um, later, he, he lives, you know, decades uh, past that. And he's, you know, he's one of the figures of the French Revolution. But when he was younger, he goes over to the United States and he fights in the army against the British. And he has an outstanding record of service in the American, you know, congressional, uh, the, the, the Continental Army, rather. And uh, so there's, a, if you go to the United States, you can still go to a bunch of cities and there's like Lafayette Street, it's named after him. Um, and so, you know, he's just one, one individual among thousands of French um, milita military figures that uh, participated in the Revolutionary War in America, and then they went back to France, and then they had their own revolution, which is a completely different story. Um, but without the French, suffice to say that that the uh, American independence was very unlikely, if impossible. I told you Benjamin Franklin was very important. That was because he went to, among other things, he chose to be the representative of uh, the American diplomacy. He went to Paris, and he convinced the French to help 
um, fight against the British. Eventually, they won the war, and uh, without that Benjamin Franklin French alliance, uh, it never would have occurred. So, <clears throat> George Washington says after they become a country, we're not going to be allies with France or Britain or anybody. And the French are pr understandably quite disappointed because they were allies during the war and they, they um, it was very expensive, obviously. And now, now the, um, <clears throat> rather than maintaining their alliance with, with the French, George Washington wants to back away. Thomas Jefferson is very pro-France and pro-French, but then the revolution kind of takes a like sudden turn uh, towards being an empire and Napoleon declares himself an emperor and then Americans don't really like that, as you know. They're against kings and emperors. So when Napoleon decides to crown himself the uh, emperor of the French, and create a French empire with him at the head is no longer a democratic revolution. He's, he's appropriated the revolution for himself. And at, at that point, you know, the distance between American Republic, the American Republic and the French empire grows. And that's the end of, of their, I mean, we, they still have the Statue of Liberty that came from France and other things. And there's, there's still some, what, what can I say? There, there's still a uh, respect between France and, and uh, the United States, but the, it's never been the same since they were allies during the war, which is too bad, really. But as you know, France and, uh, you know, the British and the French never have got along, even except for during world wars. The, the French and the British haven't gotten along very well for the last 1,000 years. So... But it's not surprising that if the Americans start to take the British side, that they wouldn't get along with the French as well. So this is what John Quincy Adams says because of George Washington's policy, essentially. He says, uh, this is his speech. And now, friends and countrymen, if the wise and learned philosophers of the elder world, the first observers of nutation and aberration, the discoverers of maddening ether and invisible planets, the inventors of Congreve, okay, this is a pretty high-minded uh, speech, but we should not go abroad searching for mon monsters to destroy. That's his speech. It's, it's quite an eloquent speech. Obviously, it wasn't designed for the average American farmer or settler. This is in 1821. There's a lot of Americans who can't even read. So, you know, when you t you're talking about nutation and aberration, these are words that only professors use. So he's not really speaking to uh, America as a whole. He's more talking to the elite. He's talking to the, the senators and the politicians. And um, this is a famous speech that, that basically, America's glory is not dominion, but liberty. Her march is the march of the mind. She has a spear and a shield, but the motto upon her shield is freedom, independence, peace. This has been her declaration. This has been as far as her necessary intercourse with the rest of mankind would permit her practice. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> that might be true as long as there's a frontier and America is fighting against natives, right? And uh, another thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the native people, there, were, there was really a, a policy of, of trying to undermine the culture of the natives. There's accusations that um, the Americans, the, the American settlers gave blankets that were infected with smallpox, which killed many native people. That, I don't know if that can be confirmed or not, but um, that would still have limited effect because the the native population was already destroyed by smallpox before anybody gave them blankets. Smallpox had already killed native people in California that had never met Europeans. Um, famously in Canada, when 
uh, Lord Vancouver takes his ship into Vancouver. It's just uh, sort of there's there was many you know villages and people living in on on English Bay. It's a very naturally uh, attractive place to live. The mild climate, the gigantic trees, lots of animals, the mountains. It <clears throat> it was occupied by natives. But when Lord Vancouver, you know, discovered English Bay you know, taking his ship in there. It was just like a ghost town. There was uh, just remnants of, of villages and bodies and <clears throat> buildings because the disease had, you know, ripped through the continents way ahead of his discovery. So when he, by the time he got there, basically the entire civilization of the West Coast um, was, you know, on the brink of I mean, it was like the Black Death, but worse. The, the Black Death wiped out, you know, we talked about how the effect on the civilization, what, how, how, much, how many people died and how it changed the entire culture of England. That's, that's what happened in the native cultures, except they didn't have uh, diseases that led up to the plague. It, it was introduced in, into their situation without any prior exposure. So the effect was like even worse. It was essentially, if you can imagine, it was like dropping an, an atomic bomb on every um, tribe in, in the, the native interior. So often by the time the Americans got there, there was hardly anything left, <clears throat> which means they, they could take advantage pretty easily. One of the things that they did was they, they killed the buffalo and they didn't kill them for food, they didn't kill them for their, their hides or their bones. Like whenever a native person killed a buffalo, they would use the entire body, their tendons, like everything, every part of the, the, the buffalo um, body, but the buffalo's body could be used for something, for, for tools or for, you know, <clears throat> they took the ligaments out and everything, they ate every part that was edible and they, 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 you know, they made blankets, they made tents, they made leather out of them. Uh, they used their bones for various tools. <clears throat> the Americans literally, they knew that the lifestyle of the Plains Indians depended on the buffalo. So they tried to kill them all. Literally, they would sit there and just like shoot into the crowd of buffalo. Like thousands of buffalo would be running around and they just shoot them until there was piles of them. And just leave them there. It was a, a, it was a sort of genocidal policy where they tried to kill all the buffalo so that the natives couldn't support themselves. It's it's a very, um, it's a very, hu it's a huge contradiction between oh don't go abroad searching searching monsters to destroy. I mean, saying that America's glory is not dominion but liberty. This guy doesn't know what's happening. He's completely out of touch with what is happening on as America's expanding. You're you're you are monsters yourselves. <clears throat> you don't need to go abroad hunting monsters because you're a monster. Sorry, President John Quincy Adams, but uh, this speech doesn't make any sense if you know what's actually going on. Like destroying the buffalo said so that uh, native people starve and have no lively uh, have no way to support themselves. Anyway. We've already talked about that issue. Right after this, this is only two years later, 1823, <clears throat> James Monroe uh, is the next president. <clears throat> he's the next president, and he, he's known for saying that um, protecting the United States' interests, right? So uh, if any foreign power like France or the United Kingdom or Spain or Russia or whatever, they, they uh, interfere with the interests of the United States that we, the United States will protect itself, okay? So it's called the Monroe Doctrine. And basically it says, it warns that European nations, it warns European nations that the United States will not tolerate further colonization or interference, any pop, puppet kings in uh, near its territory. Again, a contradiction because what does America do? They 
they are doing the same thing. You could say, I mean, controversially, Russia, what is Russia doing? Um, it's the whole war is a, essentially about who controls the territory around Russia. It's, it's the same as this. This is from 1823. Uh, Russia could argue that, yeah, well, we have the same thing. If, if there's um, countries that are allied with other people and have interests that are not uh, in line with Russia, then we're going to take action. That's the Ukraine conflict revolves around that. I'm not saying the America's, America's to blame or Russia's to blame. I'm just saying that the policy of the United States, that's another contradiction. If they're, if they're, they're being hypocrites, Russia's just doing what the United States has basically done for 200 years. Why is our other countries not allowed to protect their territorial integrity in the same way? <clears throat> I, I said this from the very beginning. If Mexico decided to be pro-Russian and that the, the, the president of Mexico had a obviously, you know, a military alliance with Russia and then put missiles, you know, from Russian military, what would the United States do? It, it would be five seconds before the military of the United States was in Mexico. It would be, in, the response would be instant. And that's something you have to think about where you're supposed to do your assignment um, by June 3rd as well. It's supposed to be related to American contradictions. There are many, don't. You can find a lot of different ones. That's just one. I just mentioned two of any number of contradictions uh, in American culture. Okay, so this means that essentially America's isolationist. They're not, they don't want, they want to remain neutral, just like George Washington said. But by, by uh, 1890, you have the frontier is closed. So there's no more internal expansion, if you want to call that it that. And, and um, there is uh, basically an attempted revolution in Cuba, which is controlled by Spain. So you have the, the Spanish-American War erupts in the 1890s, basically because the United States argues that, according to the Monroe Doctrine, we don't want uh, we don't want Spanish, you know, military power right near our territory. Florida is now part of the United States, and Cuba's like close enough that you can get on a, a boat and like sort of get yourself across there even if you don't have like a ship or something some people apparently some people have even like um, been able to swim across that this is pretty far but it's close enough close enough that it's very easy to attack it's very easy to move things there so they don't want this they don't want they they want to support cuban independence they don't want spain interfering so they end up deciding, this is a sort of turning point, they end up deciding that they're going to participate. And so they send soldiers to uh, Cuba to fight against the Spanish. And this starts a war between them and they end up fighting the Spanish everywhere and, and including the Philippines. So all of you are probably familiar with the Philippines and how they have a sort of mixed culture, Spanish, English, and their own indigenous culture. And there's many islands Spain's um, economy and military had been steadily declining for hundreds of years. So when the United States, who's you know an economic powerhouse now, and um, and uh, you know rapidly um, I increasing its power militarily, when they fight, literally the Spanish ships and the Spanish soldiers and the the um, money available, everything is out of date, it's old technology, they're not, on, they're not trained well, they, and they know it, they know it, but they fight anyway, which is a brave thing to do. But literally the, you know, the, the American, in the Philippines, the American uh, steamships, ironclad steamships just obliterate, you know, it's not, uh, I think it's Admiral Dewey <clears throat> uh, or, or Captain Dewey, Admiral Dewey, there's a battle where basically the Americans just go back and forth and fire their weapons 
and uh, the um, Spanish just, they can't even move their ships. They, they don't have as good of, you know, cannons. They don't have, their, their ships are made of wood and the Americans got these steam powered like metal ships and they just blow them apart. And the, the Spanish Admiral just takes it until there's this, you know, they're all sinking and then he just runs up the flag. And I think, you know, three Americans end up dying from an accident. Um, that's the, the Spanish actually do no damage to them and don't kill anybody. It's just a, um, a tragedy, not, it's not a real battle. And that's how the Philippines gets taken over um, by the United States and they stay the United States stays in the Philippines and influences their culture for a long time. We don't have a time to talk about that, but when when the United States replaces and they and the Philippine the people in the Philippines rebel against them and they suppress them, aren't aren't they are they any better than the Spanish? Like the these Filipinos don't really want to trade the Spanish Empire for an American Republic that's treating them the same way. Like, isn't it an American empire? Even if you don't call it that, you're doing the same thing. So you get this kind of weird, imperialist, jingoistic uh, mood in America. And then, then they sort of pull back from it because they are becoming an empire and most of the Americans don't think that's what they should do. They don't really, the Philippines could have become a state, but they pull back from that. Cuba easily could have become an American state, but they decide not to make it a state. Later, Hawaii will join and become a state, but the Philippines uh, will not. And there, there, if you know, there's you know Guam uh, and other places, Puerto Rico, they're, they're not states, but they're sort of <clears throat> um, American territories. So, there's a weird, there's a weird uh, aversion for empire, but they still do things that empires do, um, but they don't call it that. <clears throat> so that's sort of this gray zone in the 1890s. And then, but then what happens is the empires of the world all start to get into this massive conflict, which we call um, World War One. And I'm going to talk about this in more detail on Friday because. I'm not gonna be able to explain it all in this lecture and I don't want this lecture to be a two hour video. So they, we'll talk about this, like I said, in more detail. World War I um, basically is the, it's the height of the, you know, the empires of the world. This is the, the late 19th century, early 20th century. The British Empire reaches its maximum size. The French Empire, Germany wants to, what Germany wants to do is is be a bigger empire. One of the reasons that they fight uh, in Europe is because abroad in Africa and Asia, they're getting, they're, they're trying to become one of these empires, but there's resistance by even smaller countries like Belgium. Belgium, Belgium has this huge African territory called the Belgian Congo, and it's massive and Germany doesn't, Germany doesn't have anything like that. They have some, you know, overseas territory in, in China and some other places in Africa, in East Africa. But why does tiny Belgium have a gigantic piece of Africa and Germany doesn't? They, they don't think this is fair. And part of the reason is because Germany unifies in 1871. Most people think of Germany as being an ancient country because there's there's so many Germanic people in different parts of Europe, but they actually don't form into a country until 1871. But when they do, when they make the Northern Confederacy, the Confederacy of the Rhine, and then they, <clears throat> this is the start of the process of the creation of the German Empire, as soon in the instant that that happens, Germany becomes the most powerful country in Europe. They become the most numerous, most important, most powerful country and they just get bigger and stronger so what happens in world war one to a certain extent is just the fact that the french especially but the russians and the french and the the british are concerned about germany becoming more and more powerful and so they make an alliance to make sure that germany doesn't 
get any stronger. And then Germany makes an alliance with Austria, Hungary, and they make an alliance with the Ottoman Turks, uh, the Ottoman Empire. And then all of a sudden you have like all the empires allied with each other. And if they start fight, one, one makes trouble with another, they all jump in and create this massive war that goes across the entire world. And that is what happened. That's what happens in 1914. And because, because these empires are so rich and powerful and they, they have all this new technology that they're developing, the weapons that they're using, people think actually, some people think that, you know, there's never gonna be war again because the weapons are so powerful that you can't actually use them, but they do. This is the, one of the tragedies is that the, the, they, they get bigger and bigger weapons. Uh, the Germans actually have a gun. The first object that goes into outer space is from this gun that the Germans have. It, it takes hundreds of horses uh, to move this thing and you have to move the gun down a railroad and then it fires uh, a shell that's the size of a, of a car and it goes up into the air like 60 kilometers into outer space and then it comes down and hits Paris from like 100 kilometers away. It's these things make people think like if we use these weapons, we will destroy our civilization. So we can't use them, but they end up doing it. And machine guns are just that's one example. Uh, you used to have to like shoot a, shoot a gun and shoot a bullet and then, you know, reload your gun for a minute and then fire again. But then they started getting these guns that could fire like, you know, all of their bullets in, in a minute right? A whole round. And then they got this, you know, the Maxim gun was the first machine gun. And basically you could, you could shoot hundreds of bullets, right? It's a, just a, it's just a killing machine. It's just designed to kill people. It's not for hunting. It's not for sport. It's just <clears throat> putting as many bullets in as many people as fast as possible. It's a killing machine. And this is the, the technology, <clears throat> scary stuff. Um, that went into, you know, trying to win the war. And, and when these, these very powerful weapons were used, the thing was that the defensive uh, technology became stronger than the offensive. So you could, you could kill, and you, if somebody attacked, you could kill all the attackers with machine guns and, <clears throat> and cannons and shells and bombs. But it was very difficult to advance. That's why the tank was invented. So, so there's all kinds of innovation. There's all kinds of revolutionary tactics and transformations. I'll talk about this more on Friday about how important World War I is. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, it, as I said in the textbook, in the middle of the textbook, I'm gonna try and deal with that on Friday too, about how the, how the 20th century is structured and, and how we can look at the 20th century in it from an American perspective. Um, at the end of the chapter, there is some notes on different presidents. So I would like you, it, as many of you as possible, to read over chapter seven. Um, usually I say read it after, but it would be very helpful if you would read some of chapter seven beforehand. Not the middle part, but the part about the presidents. You've got Churchill on page 232. And he's the prime minister of, <clears throat> of the, the British Empire in World War II. And then there's the American presidency on 245. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, F FDR, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, Reagan, and then finally the Bushes, Clintons, Ob Obama, and Trump. Um, <clears throat> so look over that because that's the material that we're going to deal with on Friday. Um, the presidents of the United States, the so-called POTUS president of the United States. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the relationship between World War I and World War II. And um, briefly, I'll, I'll describe Churchill's role as the British Bulldog, a representative of a sort of last gasp of the British Empire. He is a Lots of people, you know, uh, do not like 
Winston Churchill because of that, because he was sort of um, um, Anglo-centric uh, imperialist. He wanted the British Empire to survive. He grew up uh, in you know the early 20th century, the late 19th century, and that's what he believed. And uh, for that, um, we should be critis we should be critical of him. But at the same time, uh, his rhetoric and his leadership and uh, his role in defeating Hitler, among other things, is is legendary, um, and it, it's sort of a good way to end, you know, all the things we talked about, about the British Empire and about the British monarchy and going right back to William the Conqueror. This is the kind of thing that um, British culture has to deal with, the legacy of the British Empire. And, and he's a good figure to talk about when we're going to try and move on um, from that era, because that's not where the United Kingdom is now. It's a totally um, the the empire has has uh, dissolved, so now it's a different sort of state. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about these things on Friday. Um, thank you for listening again, and uh, we have one more of these, as I said, new content lectures um, before we we conclude our journey through American and British culture for the semester. So thank you for listening, and I will see you on Friday.